it's 10 after 2. Uh, let's go ahead and start this, uh, this committee hearing. We don't yet have quorum, but we can uh, go ahead and hear um, item 2. Uh, we can get a, a presentation um, on item 2 to begin with. Uh, I, yes. Item number 2, Mark Perry instructing the LAPD to report with opinions and recommendations relative to requesting requiring special store shelf storage and or warning signage for the retail sale of energy drinks as well as restricting or limiting the consumption of energy drinks by city personnel while on duty and related matters. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I understand that we have from uh, Council Member Bernard Park's office, we have no, Noel Palais here. Please uh, come up. And we also have uh, a few members from the Medical Services Department. Uh, I'm sorry, Medical Services through personnel. Uh, we have Joanne O'Brench. Is that correct? Oh, it is O'Brien. Okay, so I just misspelling. And then Dr. Manukian. Uh, if you could please uh, come up. There we go. Or, or either or. or there, there's one. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you. And uh, before we hear from uh, medical services, let's, uh, let's have uh, Mr. Palais on behalf of Councilmember Bernard Parks, please. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, Councilmember Labonge. Uh, thank you for considering this item. Uh, basically, what we want to go ahead and do is relative to these uh, sweetened beverages that contain the large doses of stimulants, which sometimes is more than actually is labeled on the can uh, for a quick boost. Uh, furthermore, one of the things that it has not been done is the FDA has not undertaken any tests for health and safety on these or has not released any information relative to, to what, the, what, what the long-term effects may be on this. So. Uh, from where we stand, there is no clear relevant data that's available right now for the uh, long-term health effects that may occur. Uh, sadly, with the death of, uh, deaths of several teens after consuming the equivalent of uh, 10 plus cups of coffee in a single 24-ounce can, uh, we, do, we are familiar with one of those long-term effects. Uh, uh, the other thing is that is really staggering are some of the numbers that have been provided by the Federal Substance Abuse uh, and Mental Health Services Administration, which showed a number of emergency room visits involving energy drinks uh, during the time frame of 2007 to 2011 doubled to nearly 21,000. And of these, approximately 1,500 of them were for children between the ages of 12 to 17. Uh, it is clear that these are not similar to common non-alcoholic carbonated beverages. Uh, and as, sh as such, there should be some provisions in place that protect our minors from purchasing a product that is shown to cause adverse effects on their health. That being said, we are looking for the possibility or the feasibility of uh, instituting these uh, similar to the STAR training with, uh, with regards to alcohol beverages or limiting the self-service uh, uh, sales of these containers to minors. Um, secondly, secondarily, the, the second aspect of this is uh, our medical services division asking for them to go ahead and put forth uh, with County Health on the possible adverse effects of uh, the consumption of these beverages, especially by those of the city family, whether they be sworn or civilian, uh, and especially those that deal with uh, city machinery or city equipment, those that deal with the public, and as, as far as there being any kind of adverse effects with regard to that impede their their, their, their ability to properly interact or, or may in, infringe on their their training or whatnot. So what we want to do is basically we want to get all the information, all the relevant information out. And so I can't stress that this is really not being big brother for the sake of being big brother. Uh, what we want to do is we want to get all the relevant, relevant facts that are available and mitigate any potential liability for the city. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, joining us here uh, on the committee is uh, Mr. Curran Price in addition to Tom LeBonge. And uh, now uh, uh, let's hear from medical services. Good afternoon. Um, I, as you guys, Speak um, to the mic and uh, oh. tell them what department you're with in your name. Mm -hmm. I'm Dr. Manukian, Medical Services Division, Personnel Department. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a physician. Uh, my knowledge about energy drinks is very limited because it's not a controlled substance. At this time, I can give you the facts. And uh, my, ma my main uh, problem, as I can see, is... Um, 
how to monitor if this uh, goes into effect, how to monitor the consumption of this drug because there's no, I mean, of the energy drink, because there's no drug test uh, that we can um, conduct um, to see to uh, monitor the consumption. Energy drinks contain about three times the amount of caffeine as cola does. Uh, one can of Coke has 35 grams um, of caffeine. One uh, can of Monster has 120 milligrams of uh, caffeine. So the, it's, all, it's two and a half to three times uh, more concentration. Excessive consumption may induce, again, may induce mild to moderate euphoria feeling, feeling uh, more energetic. Uh, uh, what was noticed in uh, me two medical studies that it increases the endurance of the upper, um, upper body musculature. So shoulders, uh, upper arms. Um, that, was, that was noted in two medical studies. Um, again, um, 16 ounces of energy drinks has, contains 80 to 300 milligram of caffeine and 16 ounces of coffee uh, contains of se uh, 70 to 200 milligram of caffeine. <clears throat> caffeine is a very mild, uh, the, 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 what I've heard is, um, is being used by uh, fire department and the, the, the concern was um, that if they fight fire, um, caffeine is a diuretic that can lead to di dehydration of the firefighter and so on. But uh, please uh, note that caffeine is a very mild diuretic in comparison with, for example, alcohol. Um, and most studies in Europe and United States, uh, they talk about a combination of energy drink uh, with alcohol. That's when the problem occurs because um, if you drink uh, pure alcohol, you feel the so-called drunkenness effect of the alcohol, and you may want to stop drinking. With combination of the with uh, with a combination of energy drink, that uh, because energy drink is a stimulant, so you are prone to cons to consume more alcohol than otherwise you would, which um, you you don't feel that effect of so-called, you know, I cannot drink anymore, I have to stop. So that, that is delayed. That's where the problem is, and then obviously you, you drink more alcohol with the, with the consequences. But um, again, pure um, effect of the energy drink, there are no validated studies to, um, to, to advocate for the, uh, for the ban at this time, in, in my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ms. O'Brien, yeah, any, any comment? Okay. Um, we also would like to hear from the police department, represented by Harry Edo. <coughs> Good afternoon. Um, let me for just... Uh, start out by saying what uh, Mr. Park's uh, staff represented, uh, the department wouldn't have any objection to that. The way the motion was originally crafted uh, placed a, a lot of the responsibility on reporting back on this with the LAPD. Um, and we, obviously there's not enough information out there, studies and whatnot, on the effects of these drinks. So um, we didn't feel it was appropriate that uh, we would be the ones to, to opine or make any recommendations um, at that point. So, um, nor would we be able to, uh, as the motion indicated originally, um, dictate to other city departments what their employees are going to be able to consume or not consume. So, uh, if the if the committee directs medical services to look into this further, we wouldn't have an objection to that. And certainly, um, minors is much different than than uh, adults, I think, uh, in our view. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you. No one else has any additional comments. No. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, we're talking about uh, energy drinks. Mm -hmm. Is that what we're talking about only now? We're talking about we're not talking about Seven Up or Pepsi no, we're, or we're talking Cola. the energy drinks. Got Correct. It. Okay, good. The uh, and the personnel department. I agree with uh, Detective Sergeant Edo. 
uh, personnel department's got to be the one because mm -hmm. you're the one that's supposed to take care of the city personnel and uniform guidelines. I think this is working. I've never had an energy drink myself, uh, and uh, I don't know what they're like, uh, what they do, but we should find out because everything is new. It's just like, you know, what does it do to people? What impact it has on driving? I don't know if there's a, if there's a cross, if you have one... Uh, alcoholic beverage to one energy drink, does that take you to a different zone? Does that make it a police issue for for the public when they go? So I think it's a new area. Uh, I don't think, and I also know Recreation of Parks, which has been strapped because of budget cuts, has had to reach out to a variety of groups in the past. And I don't know, has this been a group that you've ever reached out to for sponsorship of anything? Do they do any sponsorship of anything or they try... Uh, no, it's been reported by the Los Angeles Fire Department that in the larger fires, some of the, like Monster will show up or Red Bull and they give out these drinks free in the large fires, which could potentially cause a hazard because of I got the heat it. and, right. And like like the uh, Kobe fire just recently, right, possibly. Right, They'll, you'll see the truck yeah. there and they're giving those out for free. Right. I mean, I could see Gatorade or something to help them, but a diuretic and something that increases yeah. your heart rate while you already have 70 pounds of extra things on top of you. You already have that stress, plus you're fighting a fire, which is very strenuous. So you add that, that monster drink. It's probably not a good idea. Yeah, I think I, what I'd really like to do, just the recommendation, is, is get the personnel directors for these large departments, whether it's sanitation, a lot of our drivers, uh, public works, fire, police, and have a meeting to discuss this issue here, and then if it is a, a substance that we should uh, not allow during work hours uh, on this issue here. Because I think safety is our number one concern for the employee as well as the public which we serve. And so if we have that, I think it's a clear channel. But I think, I don't think we can put it on the police department's uh, shoulders. Is multiple departments. And then also we have to be cautious too, because I know the uh, situation, a lot of people like to you know, be good, but at the same time, is it, does it work within what you would know as the best interest as personnel for uh, the city? And Mr. Labonge, I, I think that we, we haven't heard from uh, Mr. Price yet, but I think where I'm headed is a report back after consulting with the departments on these concerns. Right. Okay. A report back uh, within 30 days, but I don't, yeah. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I, 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 I see your point. The only direction motion would be to request personnel department to have I'm sure you have quarterly meetings with your personnel directors in each department at some point. So make this a top agenda item and, uh, and discuss it and come back with the recommendation on that. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Price. Yeah. I certainly am a, a supporter of the report back. I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we just don't know enough. Uh, but I am curious, have any other municipalities adopted some restrictions or no, any, not, any other I'm aware of because restrictions at the state or city level? Any place else? Not that I'm aware of. And we can certainly look into that. But just to add on what Dr. Mnookin stated is that it's it would be very hard to regulate. There's no test. There's, for example, you know, when we do drug testing on our employees, you know, we can test for amphetamines or some of the opiates, things like that, there would be no way for us to test and so hard to regulate, you know. Like for, um, for nicotine, you can do the drug test and see if the person has been using, you know, a tobacco product within the last 90 days. There is no test that exists for the energy drink. So my question is, um, since it's a, there is, there is a debate in the court whether to consider this as a beverage or as a dietary supplement, because currently it's a dietary supplement, but uh, the production manufacturer wants to change that to the, uh, to the beverage, and then the FDA will opine whether it's a safe beverage or that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, um, I understand your instructions, but I think it uh, might be premature. Maybe we want to wait until the FDA opines whether it's a beverage or not, or a dietary supplement, then we can issue the recommendation. At least we will have the opinion of the FDA mm -hmm. to govern or to navigate us through this. But the problem is, again, it's monitoring. For example, uh, I understand the concern, the safety, but uh, the issue is monitoring. There is no drug test known to, to uh, science that we can enforce the, 
the 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 use of this uh, beverage or slash uh, dietary supplement. That's where we are right now. In uh, France, for example, uh, it was it did it did not hit the market because there was an athlete who uh, consumed a lot of energy drinks, and the problem is when they consume. Uh, more than three a day and he collapsed because of the cardiac arrhythmia and he died but then they took it to the court uh, and the ban was reversed um, again because it's just, this is not a, a medical drug it's not a substance that will all it does it increases your alertness mm -hmm. right. so I, I do not see this the the correlation between the 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 energy use and safety issues because it's not suppresses your nervous system it increases your alertness just the coffee and the concentration that I just gave you as an example 70 bet between 70 to 200 versus 80 to 300 is not that big of a difference mm -hmm. so with the same rationale someone might say you know we're gonna limit that the person does not drink more than five cup of coffees a day and is that is that a uh, is that a valid uh, direction to go to I'm not sure okay uh, I, I, I'm going to. Rec I, I know that at this time you have no recommendation, and, and I, I totally respect that. I think that just in the interest of of uh, this issue not going away, notwithstanding there's there's no FDA uh, opinion uh, yet, um, but in the interest of exploring this, um, on behalf of our colleague Bernard Parks, because it it seems to be an issue that does affect uh, firefighting safety and other personnel. Um, Perhaps, uh, well, let me just let me just recommend that you uh, continue uh, conversations with his office, um, and in consideration of restricting or limiting um, these types of beverages to personnel, and that you also um, work with the fire department uh, specifically, check in with them on on uh, ideas that they may have, and then we'll report do. back to this committee. We'll do. That one thing. Thank you. Write a letter to the Secretary of Labor. Uh, the general manager, whatever you could, if the, if the federal government's not moving, at least go on record. Let's not wait because it may be next year. We want a year of action, but uh, we want to make sure it happens now, so we can't wait. So if you write a letter to whomever's the right person in the federal government on these issues, so we go on record, because right now we have a record, and I see our city attorneys are here, and if we don't do something, it could come back to uh, haunt us. So that would be good if you could. Maggie Whalen, she'll sign it if you write the right draft. Okay, doctor. Good. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. And we do have one uh, speaker on, on this item, and that is uh, Lisa Gritzner from the American Beverage Association. I'm not entirely certain that that microphone's working. Okay. But maybe, maybe check it. Lisa. Hello? Okay, yeah. now yeah, it is. Okay. Hi there. Thank you. Sorry for the last minute addition. I just thought I might be able to shine some additional light on this conversation. Lisa Gritzner from Sorel Associates, representing the American Beverage Association. Uh, the manufacturers of Red Bull and Monster Energy, for example, are members of the ABA. Uh, and obviously this is an issue that has gotten a tremendous amount of scrutiny and study. In fact, uh, there was a very recent FDA study that was just completed uh, last week, I think, where the results were released that were very inconclusive and so I think the FDA has decided that they are going to continue to look at this but that there is no hard science no hard evidence as the doctor has pointed out that have pointed to any uh, circumstances where there should be cause for alarm and in fact the US government has done extensive study on the use of these types of beverages uh, in military service and it's actually something that they uh, provide to soldiers who are uh, in combat duty and in other uh, circumstances as uh, something that they recommend so um, all I wanted to say is that there is a tremendous amount of science and study that is available and that the American Beverage Association would very much like to partner with the department on as they do their research and be able to provide whatever information we can to help uh, shed some light on the subject and any potential uh, regulations or legislation that would come out. We certainly hope that we would be a part of that conversation going forward. So thank you for the chance to speak today. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, uh, we'll be holding this in committee pending uh, for the report back. Please. Very good. All right, moving uh, ahead, uh, what I'm going to recommend to the committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a second. I'm moving on. Uh, 
to my colleagues, I'm going to recommend that um, items three through nine uh, are on consent. That we move forward on consent. Yeah, let me just, uh, just move the last one. I'll move Please. that, Mr. Hold Chair. Hold on, I have one. Just on five. How many bidders were on five? That's all the only question. How many people bid on number five? So, so Mr. Labonge, would you like to hear item five then? A report on item five. Number. Uh, uh -huh. the number. How many people bid? How many people bid on number five? That's all. All right. Then let let me back up then, because if we're going to have a comment on this, then we we're not we can't waive it on consent. And I would like to move to item number one. If she just tells me the number, I'll be okay. I'll okay. Be, no. so I, I, I just want to make sure procedurally, we're okay here. All right. Um, Procedurally, I have to read it if you've got questions for a particular entity on the item. I can read it right. real quick. Uh, City Administrative Officer report relative to a proposed concession agreement with AM Best Food, Inc. for the operation and maintenance of the Los Feliz Golf Course Cafe located at 3207 Los Feliz Boulevard. There you go. How many people bid on that? Uh, Agnes Cole, Recreation and Parks. There, we did not go out on an RFP for this particular concession. We're extending the uh, current concession there for up to three years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, are we can yeah, can go. we still move item five on consent along with the others? Then? Yeah, good. Okay, so uh, item th uh, items three through nine on consent, and it was moved by uh, Mr. Price. And that brings us to uh, item number one. Item number one, Department of Recreation and Parks report relative to a Venice Beach public safety needs assessment. On September 3rd, 2013, the Public Safety Committee waived consideration of this matter. All right, and we have uh, our colleague, Councilmember Mike Bonin, here today um, to speak to this issue. Good morning, committee members. Uh, my name is Mike, and I am a caffeine addict. Uh, I should Just make you know it's the afternoon. It's uh, your past morning. So oh, good afternoon. Good morning. See, that's why I needed my caffeine. I should uh, be clear. I'm testifying under the influence of a 16-ounce low-carb monster drink that I had about an hour ago. So you came to the right place. Just so you know. <laughs> You've seen your hair, man. I think that's fascinating. Uh, thank you for hearing this matter today, and thank you for your attention to this issue today. Uh, this motion was introduced in council shortly after a, a big tragedy in Venice last summer, uh, which we all remember, um, when there was a horrible, horrific incident at Venice Beach where a madman tried to kill people and succeeded in, in one horrible and, and, and tragic case. While that incident prompted this motion, this motion in this report is fundamentally not about that incident. Uh, we're not seeking today in this report uh, to do the impossible, which is to find an infallible way to stop a madman who's determined to do harm. What this motion and what this report really is about is the fresh eyes that my office, Reckon Parks, LAPD, and a number of city departments brought to the question of public safety at one of our most heavily traveled tourist destinations in Los Angeles in the wake of that accident. Many of us may remember a horrible incident in Santa Monica 10 years ago where a gentleman accidentally mowed down a number of people at the Santa Monica's far farmer's market, uh, killing, maiming, and injuring many. This motion today is in part meant to address that situation and address the question of how you deal with public safety at a place that is simultaneously a park, a neighborhood, a business district, and an international tourist destination. Because it is all of those things simultaneously, there are at least 30 streets that run in to the Venice Beach boardwalk. They're absolutely perpendicular to them. And at most of those locations, there is little or no indication that you are about to enter a pedestrian area or a park. At few of those areas is there a physical structure that prevents you from entering that park. 
ironically, one of the very few intersections that does have that protection is the one where the incident happened uh, last summer. Uh, and the person deliberately drove up onto a sidewalk and around those barriers. But LAPD told me in the wake of that incident that the, the, the scary, frightening Santa Monica Farmer's Market incident, the sort of Mr. Magoo scenario, happens as many as 15 times a day, where people accidentally drive onto the boardwalk. Uh, and that's something we need to take steps to address. And that's what many of the recommendations before you from Rec and Parks and DOT and our public safety uh, agencies recommend. In the wake of that accident, though, we also looked at what it means to keep this unique place that is neighborhood, business district, park, and international tourist destination safe for visitors, for the community, for city employees. Unfortunately, we treat Venice Beach the same way we do any other park. There is someone who's in charge of maintenance, there's someone who's in charge of programming, and fortunately at Venice Beach we have someone from LAPD who's down there. But there is no overall facilities manager. There is no one whose sole job is to think about how to govern Venice Beach. There's no one whose sole job is to think about how does this intersect with the community, how do we program this place, how do we think about security vulnerabilities. So we put together a task force to look at those questions until we're able to get that person and that governance structure in place. And among the recommendations they made is we need to dramatically improve lighting down at Venice Beach. Uh, it is dimly lit and at night it is a scary place, unfriendly for residents and unfriendly for business. Uh, and under my predecessor's watch, they put in some brighter lighting at a small stretch. This report calls for a continuation of that and installation of, of more lighting. LAPD has also asked us to look at the issue of whether or not we should have a loudspeaker system down there. In the case of, of an accident or a tragedy or a natural disaster, there is no way for LAPD to communicate or give instructions to tens of thousands of people on, on how to get out of there. There also are, on the public spaces down there, little to no security cameras installed, like we have in Hollywood, like we have at most major tourist destinations in the world. When there is an incident down there, a criminal incident, the only chance we have of capturing something on film is because of the civic-minded business people and property owners on the east side who have cameras. And we sorely need that and a lot more. So Rec and Parks has been the lead agency working with DOT, Street Services, LAPD, LAFD. They've come up with a very good report. My neighborhood council has reviewed it. They liked some of the suggestions. They disliked some. Uh, I'm recommending approval of the report as is, having taken those concerns into consideration. Um, would ask the committee to support that report today. Would ask the committee to uh, direct CAO and CLA to find ways to begin funding a phase in of these recommendations and then uh, ask that you send it uh, to Budget and Finance Committee for further consideration which is incidentally where I need to get back to in a few minutes. But uh, I thought, do any of the members have questions for me before Rec and Parks? Thank you, Mike. I just have one thing, because you made a good point, and I uh, welcome Mike Shaw here. Uh, uh, just our, our dynamic is changing, and I uh, pushed hard long ago and lost it. Hopefully it's coming back for a super, superintendent position of the 4,500 acres of Griffith Park. Uh, you bring up a great point, and I would support you. And if you're on budget and finance, give him a position of superintendent of Venice Beach. Uh, it makes a tremendous idea. And also at the same time, I think, and I hope, I'm just going to say this publicly, that uh, the mayor uh, sees uh, in what we all see in uh, Mike Scholl, that in these, when given the full reins, that reorganization somewhat, where there's, where there's a silos, there's silos, there's maintenance and there's operations. There needs to be a, 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 tri a pyramid that does out, and you have the outreach with Los Angeles Police Department, etc. I know the location. I know it's easy for us to drive in there, but that shouldn't be easy anymore, you know, because it is that. But I would just strongly support, and I know Mr. Scholl in the back of his mind, and uh, he has a new commission to look at a superintendent, someone who could really be that, because you got more bodies, uh, I shouldn't say that word, more persons, uh, like they talk about Hollywood Boulevard, Mitch, in your area between Orange and uh, Highland and Orange is the density. most people, is yeah, the, the greatest. Is very similar. So that's the only thing I'd recommend. I know you've got a good committee. I would strongly support 
all your concepts, but I really still under the wing and the control of the general manager of the commission. I don't want to see a charter change, but I think if he sets up a management that does have a, a superintendent level, that's a high level, like you have at Menlo Park, Menlo uh, uh, Bill Robertson Way, Expo, Expo Park. Thank you. Th that would actually be a start. Uh, it, it probably isn't the, the, the full solution. Our situation at Venice is more complex because what we think of as Venice Beach and what people experience at Venice Beach is partially under recreation and parks, partially under public works, and partially under the county's jurisdiction, uh, and a tiny piece under the state. So we actually need even, even, even greater coordination on that. I, I, I should say also, um, thank you for mentioning Hollywood. Uh, when I took office, I decided that, that one of my priorities was going to be to uh, try to steer a renaissance of Venice Beach similar to the renaissance of, of Hollywood over the past decade and a half. It used to be that people would go to Hollywood 10, 12 years ago, and you'd see posts on TripAdvisor saying, wow, this is not what I expected. And they weren't saying that in a favorable way. And too often that happens at Venice Beach because we haven't sufficiently invested in it. And too often folks think of Venice Beach as... Oh, it's Abbott Kenny. It's GQ's coolest tip of street with all the property values. It's not like that. Uh, it has decayed, and it needs uh, an infusion of support from the city of Los Angeles, and I'm, I'm trying to uh, light a fire under that. So thank you for your consideration. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And I would say this, that there are more similarities in terms of the jurisdictional challenges to the L.A. River. Yes. They're, they're minus the people, you know. Yep. Uh, the LA River has so many cross jurisdictional challenges, which has uh, we've we've done a lot of work on trying to um, mitigate just those issues, and I think there are similarities to Venice uh, on that. Very true, but you have the massive humanity there at the same time. Yeah. It's it's shocking to me. This is 15 vehicles per day on average. That means on some days there's probably 30, and on other days there's none. That's uh, that's pretty amazing and illustrates the need for this to be addressed in some very constructive way with an, an incredible sense of urgency. Yes. So thank you. Thank you for coming in. Thank and you we'll very let much. you get to your committee. Thanks very thank much. You. Appreciate it. Thank you, colleagues. And uh, now we have uh, General Manager Mike Scholl, Reckon Parks, to give, our, to give his report. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Mike Scholl, Reckon Parks. Um, so we got a PowerPoint uh, presentation to go through. I think it'll just... Uh, help get through the issues and some of the, the, the complexities of the, of the different types of uh, entry points that you have down there and some of the safety issues that we have. Um, I will... It is not working. Is our tech guy here? Because it's now it's not advancing. Uh oh No. Go like this. Uh -huh. There it <laughs> We talked earlier, so uh, anyway, I'm not going to, uh, there was an assessment team that was set up, but it was, um, uh, Rec and Parks was kind of at the helm of it, but we, we worked with uh, LAPD, LA Fire, Street Services, uh, Bureau of Engineering, LA DOT, the Mayor's Office, City Attorney's Office, and of course Council District 11. We met several times, um, did many walkthroughs of the beach area. The councilman pretty much framed the situation that we have down there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on this particular slide, but I think we all agree um, that Venice needs to be treated like the destination that it is and that it has not been so in the past. Um, this is an important slide because it gives you the, the four distinct areas of the different street types. There's actually 32 streets that, that hit the boardwalk. Um, the first type of street that hits would be what we call the closed model, and that is where there's existing bike racks or existing bollards that already are there, and that it would make it very difficult for a vehicle to go through there, and it certainly gives a sign that you, you cannot go through there. There's another uh, uh, many access points that are under the emergency slide, uh, emergency um, section there, and that's where streets have uh, have limited access, but nonetheless, there's there's access that's needed for deliveries, things like that, and as well as emergency personnel like LA, LAFD and uh, LAPD. Um, and then there's other areas that are just open, um, where a good example of that would be, so there's at least two parking lots on the west side of the boardwalk. Well, you have to cross the boardwalk to enter this, those parking lots. So there's no, you could literally make a left turn onto the boardwalk if you didn't go straight into the parking lot 
or make a right turn. And you could do the same coming out of the parking lot. And I would, and the councilman is correct. That happens quite frequently. I was there Friday night to do a, uh, a visual tour with the uh, LAPD and and um, and the council district. And um, I saw two vehicles myself that came out of the parking lot and turned right onto the boardwalk. They quickly stopped and realized what they had done, but nonetheless, they they uh, they did do it. So you have those those sorts of access points. And then there's another, the last access point you have is there's parking lots. Um, there's mainly one, other than the ones that are owned um, by Recreation and Parks and operated by the county, those generally have a wall or something. It's mainly just where they access the parking lot that you can get onto the boardwalk. But there's, pri there's a private lot there that's depicted in the, the fourth. I don't know if somebody can dim the lights. It might be a little easier to see this as well. Um, Eric, can you read this? You go sit over there and you'll see it. Might make it a little easier to see. So uh, anyway, you could literally just drive. You know, on most days there's vendors set up along on that private edge, but um, you know you can drive right through the parking lot and onto the. So there's there's you know 32 entrance points. One of the, one of them fit at least one of these four scenarios that that's on this slide. Now this is where the real analysis, and it's very difficult to read, but the, uh, we looked at the 32 locations beginning at Washington all the way up to, to the very northern end of the uh, boardwalk, which was Marine. I should have said the most southern point is Washington. Um, and what you see on this is noted where we all agreed with, especially with fire and PD, and the ones that the emergency access points which are in red. They must have those points. So you cannot just put bollards. You just can't put, you know, uh, planters or something in the way. They need access to get onto the boardwalk. And again, while we were there, the fire department was on the boardwalk responding to an emergency. I think it happens many times a day um, where they are called to the board and they literally drive their equipment um, uh, onto the boardwalk. So those red, you know, th those are the challenging, very challenging parts of, of what we do there. But we'll talk a little bit about the solutions as we go on. So when we did the analysis, and there's, I'm not going to show you 32 slides of every location, but just so you know that as I kind of scroll through the here, you'll see examples like this is at 28th Street. That's an actual picture. And then we put uh, of what's there in the upper left-hand corner. You can see there's three bollards there. Now, aesthetically, we can improve that, even though you could drive a vehicle down there. You'd run into the bollards. But I, I think as part of this process, we also looked at is how can we improve these, the aesthetics and maybe remove the bollards and put like a bike rack, which could be something that uh, maybe an artisan of Venice designs or something like that. Um, this is a, a current closed street that has, uh, that has uh, some bollards that you, you kind of see up in the uh, upper left-hand corner. But, you know, those, those streets could be changed to plazas. I mean, there's lots of things that you could do there and then also, um, you know, put ball, you know, nicer looking bollards across there or planners or bike racks. Uh, many different things to restrict access to there. This would be not a. This would not be a solution for an emergency access point. Um, again, just another example of um, what it looks like today and what it could look like. Here would be an emergency access point. Um, we had, and by the way, we had a lot of help from some uh, uh, landscape architectural students and architectural students from uh, University of Southern California that actually put together a lot of the graphics for us, so I should, uh, should thank them. For, they did a lot of work on this for us. Is that also called the crossbar gate? That's, we call, commonly refer to those as a T-gate. T-gate. Right. But, uh, you know, it's just, the idea would be is that, you know, you can paint and it. it doesn't have to be that ugly yellow. It could be something else. But there's very few solutions to where if you want to limit vehicles, um, in you know through there now we can put we can improve the signage we can do all that but if you want to actually restrict it you need a gate where there's a lock on it to where PD and fire can open and, and still get access to here's an example of you know where I was describing earlier we have traffic that actually crosses the boardwalk and that's where a lot of problems actually happen where um, you know, uh, as, as the councilman put it, like a you know, some a tourist or somebody would accidentally turn left or right onto the boardwalk instead of going into the in, into the parking lot or exiting the boardwalk. So the, these types of bollards we could put in; they would not work as permanent fixtures. They need to be able to be removed. And really, the only thing that really works in an emergency would probably be a retractable automated bollard that lowers and raises automatically with a remote or something that LAPD or fire has. The thing that worries us about those are is because of the environment, the marine environment, 
we're likely to going to have issues with the operations and maintenance of those. And I would, um, so we're still struggling with what we do there um, in this particular case. Just a point. I'm sure LAX has those. So you may want to check with LAX. They disappear and go up because of security and just see what they got. There, there's, yeah. we, we have, there's loads of agencies that have, and this is not too new technology. You can find them everywhere. We're in the coastal zone. You know, yeah, I mean, it's, no. the, difference, the difference here is, is we're literally on the beach. I mean, it's not, there's not a lot of buffer, but it, it can be done. It's just going to be additional maintenance that we're going to have to budget for and take care of. Um, uh, this is uh, kind of down at, um, I believe this is down at Washington, uh, which gets a little complicated. Um, although DOT, although this does show uh, signals down there, DOT is not recommending that we that we move forward on uh, signals. It gives a false sense of security to um, to the passerbys on the bike path. Uh, that's another look at uh, the current condition down at Washington, looking uh, back at the bike path. Um, you know, we can add some signage and some diversions here to keep people in a safer way, and we will be implementing those. Here's an example of uh, the parking lot. So you can see where we've added bollards along the edge and maybe possibly planters along the edge of the parking lot. The vendors could still set up. There shouldn't be any, as long as they're spaced appropriately, that a vehicle can't fit through, you could still have ADA access, and all those things can be very easily accommodated for. Um, the thing I will note about the planters is, is that we've had a lot of discussions about planters because they would need water. We're not really well suited with our current maintenance levels to, to hand water plants. So one idea would be is maybe we could have the businesses down there adopt some of these planters instead of putting these, you know, um, uh, bollards up. We could put large planters that would stop a vehicle, but at the same time, we need somebody to take ownership of them. Um, you know, and these are just different different examples as we go through of, uh, of what's actually out there. I think a lot of it can be accommodated with um, with bike racks, but at some point, um, uh, you know, we need we're going to need to have additional bollards down there. But I think as for as many bollards, new bollards that we put in, because I know the neighborhood council is not favorable of those, I would say we could probably take just as many out of the existing bollards that are there and put bollards back in that are better suited for these some of these locations and remove the bollards in other areas and then maybe put bike racks there. So I think there's some common ground that we can find there on that. Um, but the emergency access points, um, the only way to really restrict that is this with, with a gate, which they are also opposed to. For now, I'm not going to finish the rest, of the rest of the slides, just to show the different street conditions. Here's where traffic crosses the boardwalk. This is anybody can cross that boardwalk. So uh, for now, what we're focused on is uh, improving the lighting along the boardwalk as well as signage. Um, DOT has put some temporary um, bollards down there. They put it up following the incident and um, you know they're probably in need of replacement already. They've already worn out. But um, we're going to focus for now uh, directly on the lighting improvements and security, you know, looking at security cameras. <coughs> as I walked down there on Friday night, um, the boardwalk in some look, it's the older lights. Um, street lighting has replaced some of the fixtures there with LEDs, which makes a big difference. Um, but there's a lot of areas um, on the west side of the boardwalk that are property that we maintain that are completely dark. And that's where all of the, uh, you know, people really are hanging out because they, I believe that they have a real sense of security because you can't see them. You can't see faces. You can't see anything in there. So I think that's, you know, some of the things we're going to need to look at. But um, the report kind of covers all of this, um, it, you know, in, in a lot more detail, but, and, and also this report. But the, the thing that, the, that I would express to the council is, is that we, you know, this was not done just by Rec and Parks. This was a consolidated, you know, very consolidated effort with a lot, you know, a number of departments, particularly fire and PD, and they've all endorsed this plan. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned, thank you, Mike. No, go ahead. Go ahead. You mentioned that the neighborhood council is not in favor of the, the ballards. Uh, they just don't want any kind of uh, objective uh, there, or they want something else, or they just... Uh, well, they, they, they think they're, they're interested in seeing um, more bike racks and planners and things, and I think we are too. I don't think we disagree. I, it just, uh, there's, uh, the bollards are more uh, permanent, less maintenance, those things. So if we're going to put in things like planters, 
Our be department just can't just dump a bunch of planners out there and not have anybody to maintain them because yes. they will be unsightly very, very soon. So uh, maybe we can create some sort of, you know, adoption plan out there with the businesses to address that. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, do you know if your staff talked with the local responding fire company? The reason I say that, uh, Mr. O'Farrell and I have a bridge in our district, and, it, and everybody was thinking one way, and it wasn't until I, I asked the engineering bureau, but then I contacted the local paramedics and firefighters, and the K-rail down the middle of Hyperion Bridge would... Uh, as, as much as it may separate traffic, it would impede and cause so much challenges if it was there. My point to you and whoever's here, if they do meet, Johnny, you have an idea on that? You could to come up here, Johnny. You know, did Local 63 say? They did. Yes, Councilmember yeah. John Gregory, yeah. Legislative Director for Councilmember Bond's office. We did consult with Fire Station 63, uh, the local fire station, and got right. the input from their captain, uh, who. Uh, spoke to the captains in the remaining shifts as well. Did they, did they have any insight? Because I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking you have this big uh, octopus of streets that come in there. They have to know their streets, which are one way, but they didn't go anyway. You know, the police too, obviously. But for response and define what are response streets, so those maybe have the open or the T-bar gate or some automated system. That but, but the others that you said, I think, uh, you know, whether they're bike racks or big planners, and, and try to get consistency with adoption. Here's the question I asked that the city attorneys are engaged, but for the city attorney, now that we've had this challenge, anything we do, we have to do the right thing. We can't say because someone doesn't want it. If, if it's defined as whatever the right thing, then we'd have to go forward, because if there's another challenge and we didn't do something because someone didn't want it, that would help put us in a different position. Is that correct now that we're reacting to a tragedy? So if a neighborhood association says we don't want this, what's right for the city and what professionals recommend, I think should be our course of action because of the tragedy that took place. That there could be, you know, whoever thought, I remember what happened after the tragedy in Santa Monica. We put K-rails around uh, our uh, farmer's market and we allowed trucks to park quote as blocking backs, you know, for, uh, for the to cloister in the farmer's market. So I just wanted to make that statement because I did recall what you said about the neighborhood council doesn't like this or that. There's a liability thing here now that is bigger than whatever we're reacting to a situation. Well, I'll say, Councilman, we, um, well, as John, John said, we, yeah, the, the local captain was actually at the table. I mean, this was a very extensive and thought out process and it was not without a lot of discussion that all these emergency access points were, were uh, discussed and agreed to. Um, we've had one meeting with the one presentation to the neighborhood council, um, and it was it, this very presentation. There was not one thing changed in this from what we presented to the neighborhood council. Um, but we didn't make any. Uh, we will need to go back and run, you know, run some other things. But there was a lot of things that we haven't. Um, I think they were reacting to the first meeting. There certainly would be other means. There's certainly things that we can do. And as I said before, I think you know some of the things as we uh, went through this, I would say to, to anybody that's concerned about bollards that I believe we can actually remove more bollards than put, than put new bollards back. <laughs> You know, replace them with artistic bike racks, or uh, you know, something that's you know that that the Venice community would could support. I think we can get past all that. I'm not too too concerned, uh, too really too concerned about that. But um, um, we are going to try to move quickly on a lot of uh, a lot of the improvements down there. And I don't think it's uh, these improvements are just they're overdue at Venice, and. Um, I know in, it, there's a couple of things happening. We're meeting, we're meeting regularly with um, LAPD and fire and, and the different uh, Bureau of Sanitation and different uh, city departments. We're meeting uh, pretty regularly now on Venice. We started internally just having our own coordination meeting about Venice Beach. And I think that's, that'll, that'll bring a lot of these solutions up to light a lot faster and a lot more, uh, everything will be a lot more seamless down there. But there's a, it just the improvements to Venice Beach are long overdue. Mm -hmm. Much like a lot of our facilities, they're overdue. Well, we're also overdue, you know, when there's a tragedy. Then, then we have to look at it. Let me ask a question. Is there anything, last question, 
and Santa Monica have any similarities? Maybe, Johnny, you're a little more familiar with that at all? You ever been to Santa Monica? Yes, sir. Yeah, but I mean, there's the little alleys or little things that come near and on the boardwalk, but not as prevalent as it is here. Yeah, I would imagine so. Got it. Thank you, Johnny. A couple of things. Uh, Sergeant, if we could get the lights turned back on. Thank you. Um, I want to echo, validate your concerns, Mr. LaBonge, um, uh, as well. I think that clearly it's official that there are hazards and risks of additional hazards that we have to address as a city, considering what happened at Venice Boardwalk uh, last summer, the tragedy that happened last summer. Um, I think that the aesthetics of what ends up being implemented there uh, is secondary, very important, because uh, I think, uh, in being deferential to our colleague Mike Bonin uh, and the residents there, whatever we do as a city needs to look good, clearly. But the, the overarching objective is to make it safer and to prohibit access to vehicles that have no business being on the boardwalk. So that's, that's the primary objective. I want to uh, ask you, and maybe ask Johnny if you want to address this, has there been, uh, within this conversation, uh, a, a cross-jurisdictional approach? In other words, have we invited the other agencies involved uh, uh, with, as, to be part of this discussion? And I ask that from a resource point of view. There's uh, uh, state agencies involved, county, uh, city, of course. Not, um, we haven't, we, we need to have a deeper discussion um, to make sure that we're well coordinated. Um, I would say that there currently exists a, a three-party agreement down there between us, the county, and the state. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as it stands up, the maintenance and responsibilities are already outlined. Um, we are the owner, the City of L.A. Recreation and Parks is the owner of the boardwalk, and we're the owner of the Venice Beach Pier. Um, and then the state is the owner of, uh, as the councilman was alluding to, is the owner of, um, uh, like, of most of Wynwood Plaza, which is one of the main plaza areas there. And then, of course, the county operates, um, and we're also the owner of the, of the parking lots. Now, the county operates the parking lots in turn to take that revenue. Then they maintain the beaches. They do all the life guarding services and all those things. So I think it's pretty clear as to where the responsibility lies, and I wish I could try to pass this responsibility on, um, but a lot of it's not just our department either. It's, it involves other city departments like DOT and street services um, as it pertains to how you, the signage and things as you approach these different, different streets. But um, certainly we're going to have more discussions with them about it, um, and certainly if there was uh, possibilities of uh, sharing of uh, the pain, we absolutely will. We'll, we'll do that. Okay. And then in your report, uh, it's basically in order to make the boardwalk safer to the fullest degree, we're talking about $1.75 million approximately, right, when you add it all up. Yeah. The 1.2 for the retractable bollard system, the uh, additional costs uh, for the gates and bollards, uh, another 150, and then... Um, uh, Hard Street closures at 400. So we're talking about a sum of money. And Councilman, if, if, yes. if I could, just that that uh, what's uh, the, we did not have the cost estimates in time for the security cameras. So right. those are not included. And I see that because the CEO and CLA have not yet uh, weighed in in terms of yeah. identifying it, the exact costs and, and op options for getting right. this funded. Yeah, the the cameras itself were. Um, it, when, when we were trying to get this report in um, on to, to meet the deadline, as it was described in the council motion, mm -hmm. we discovered that the discussion with the cameras was much more detailed as far as with the location and how and what, you know, they would all work with ITA and the whole the whole thing. So um, we, we just actually, within the last two weeks, have got a plan that we believe is LAPD is approved for the cameras. So we'll be getting cost estimates on that, but certainly they're going to be in excess. They're going to need to be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars range, but we have not uh, priced that out yet. I just wanted you to be clear that that price is not, not, yet, included, not in this. So we're talking in, in the ballpark of a little over $2 million yeah. for the whole package. Right. So it becomes a budgetary issue. Right. It's, clearly, we know where we want to head, and without you know, all the aesthetic details 
as, as discussed. But this being a budget uh, issue, I am moving that we send this report to the Budget Finance Committee um, uh, and that, that, um, that the city, we can continue to compel, and maybe we don't need to, but the CAO and CLA to work on identifying these you know, funding opportunities uh, for this package of proposals that are uh, clearly needed at Venice. Um, that's that's going to be my recommendation. Yeah, just as a question, I know it's uh, new for your administration. Do you know what we get a year from our public parking lots? How much revenue? From no, I do not. From our from the lots from the at Los Venice, Angeles, Be Venice Beach. No, it's managed by the county. We don't have access to. But the they give you they, they give you a check. No, no, they they collect the they collect the revenue. We don't get the pub. You, we, we, you said you own public parking lots. We own them, but it's part of the which what part of the three-way agreement. Mm -hmm. They they collect the revenue and in turn may do all the maintenance and life guiding services. Okay, and this goes by. Do you know? And I think did we ever have Los Angeles lifeguards? There was a consolidation of lifeguards post Prop 13, and I don't know if the Los Angeles lifeguards did. There were state lifeguards, there was county lifeguards, and there was uh, city lifeguards. I don't know if they ever did. Your beach, but there may be as long as well, 1978 when I, that was. We uh, we do we do do lifeguarding at a couple beaches within the city. The Brio Beach, you're right, but we don't. We don't. I don't <coughs> on the we interior ever, of the bay, not the ocean that's side. Correct. I don't think All we've right. ever done it. It has performed that at Venice Beach. Okay, maybe before 13 though. May, were you born yeah. before 13 or after? I'm teasing you, Mike. Uh, Johnny, what year were you born, man? 84. 84. Got a oh here. my gosh. Right. 30 this year. Give Johnny a big hand. <laughs> Very young. All right, so, so that's, you know, that's, that's another great point you make. Uh, we need to explore revenue possibilities for Venice Beach, clearly, as well. So I hope... And can I... May I, may I so on the... Um, we have explored looking, and I just... Because I think it's important, because it, the, the revenue from those parking lots always comes up. Um, We, we have explored looking at those those lots and possibly taking those back but the there's a huge huge uh, pitfall in that whole thing is that it adds a great deal of additional maintenance and, and services and, and not just the actual cost of the service but the startup cost um, of buying all of that equipment and doing all those things mm -hmm. um, we never felt that it was a reasonable approach on on taking that back. We think that the, the three-party agreement works very well. However, on other revenue sources, um, we are looking at, um, just in a short amount of time that we've been meeting with the councilman's office, things like um, looking at doing special uh, events and uh, down there, similar to what we do at Pershing Square with uh, the ice skating rink, doing some really, you know, out-of-the-box things down there as well that could generate revenue. And more importantly, generate more family kind of uh, type of involvement down there. Um, so we're going to continue to look at those things. Last year we did the zip line that was down there, which um, went okay. Could have been better, but it went okay. Um, and, you know, we'll continue to do that. Um, we are, um, we've also, are, as part of our current budget, have uh, reorganized our staffing as such that um, we have dedicated um, uh, building trade staff down there because the restrooms down there's there's more than 50, I think there's 55 stalls uh, restroom stalls down there and at any one time I mean you could find a dozen of them out of service um, just because of the use so we've got um, full-time staff down there working now to, to keep the up and we're, we're going through the facility right now and trying to do upgrades and we we, d we didn't start doing that right away only because we were waiting for LAPD um, who did step up their patrols there um, to give more security because it doesn't do us any good to invest down there if it's just going to be vandalized. So we're working hand in hand on this. I think it's going to take, it's going to be very much a collaborative effort across the city departments to make this work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions, colleagues? Did, uh, I think West LA is here. Mm -hmm. uh, there are no comments on this, uh, on this item. Do you want to say anything? Mm -hmm. All right. And seeing as there are no uh, comments on item number one. Are there any public comments in general? There are no public comments in general. Um, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, for mm -hmm. purposes of um, the record on this, are we going to then forward this or make a request for referral to budget and finance on this yes. matter? Yes. Yes, please. And as far as any other specific recommendations for Action House Committee, do we have any or, or not? Uh, seeing as there are no objections, this is to uh, for referral to budget and finance. Very good. Thank you.
Thank you, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.